I'm kind of obsessed with pre-algebraic forms of mathematics, particularly geometric constructions. Going from one to the other was one of the more radical changes in intellectual history. Read a scientific or a mathematical work from more than about 250 years ago, and you'll see that the past really is a foreign country. As part of this, I've recently been reading about sundials. I made a pair of equatorials back in the knots, gifts for my aunt and mother, but I haven't done much with them since. Now that I have more experience working with older mathematical tools, I thought I would have some fun exploring the techniques again. So for a horizontal sundial, that is what I would personally consider to be the most generic, most archetypical sundial, the problem comes down to projecting circular rays onto an oblique plane. Every hour the Earth turns by 15 degrees. If we were at one of the poles, then all these rays, called hour lines, would be evenly spaced. But because we're almost certainly somewhere else, the distortion caused by projecting that ideal circle onto a locally horizontal plane has to be accounted for. Note that this style of sundial is designed to work best in the mid-latitudes. At the poles, the gnomon degenerates into a simple rod, as the sun can be shining from any direction. And within the tropics, most of the hour lines merge as the sun moves directly overhead. Other styles are more appropriate there, such as the equatorial I showed earlier. To determine exactly where the hour lines should be for our location, we need to do a little math. In modern terms, we want to find the inverse tangent of the tangent of t times the sine of l. t is the angle from the 12 o'clock line to each desired hour line. Imagine the hour hand on a 24-hour clock and the angle it makes with the vertical meridian. We will take this angle, which for hour lines will always be a multiple of 15 degrees, and plug it into the equation to get the angle it should be on our dial. L is simply the latitude of where the sundial will be used. So if you are making one for someone else, make sure to use their latitude, not yours. Evaluating this expression is easy enough using a calculator, or even a set of trig tables, but it can actually be done just as easily using only the tools of Euclid. We're just not used to thinking of it that way. We'll start by doing this with a classic construction. First we lay out the outline of the dial we're creating. This sets the scale. We aren't using predefined units of measurement here, so this circle will define how big our one is. It's our unit circle. Now we need the sine of the latitude. I'll draw the angle of the latitude in using a protractor, but we'll see a different way to do that later. From here we draw a perpendicular that intersects point F. This creates a right triangle, with the hypotenuse being the radius of our unit circle. Thus, by opposite over hypotenuse, the length of this line must be the sine of the latitude. Next we need the tangent of the angle of each hour line we want to mark on the sundial. We'll use the compass to swing the length of the sine up onto the central meridian. This will define a new circle. From its center we will draw out rays every 15 degrees, one for every daylight hour. These create a series of triangles when they meet the horizontal axis. The bases of these triangles are the tangents we need. However, they haven't been drawn on our unit circle, but instead on the circle with a radius that is sine of the latitude L. All tangents drawn on that circle are automatically scaled by exactly the amount we want, making the length of each one the sine of L times the tangent of T. Almost done now. Using these points on the horizontal axis, we draw lines through the origin of the unit circle. Because the horizontal line is tangent to the unit circle, this is the geometric equivalent of inverse tangent. It gives us the angles whose tangents are the links we started with. Inverse tangent is also known as arc tangent for this exact reason. We've taken a tangent length and turned it back into an arc of a circle. And with that, we're done. These rays coming from the origin of the unit circle each have an angle defined by the arc tangent of tangent of t times sine of l, which is the correct projection from a circle onto an oblique plane. We now have the face for our sundial. I recently picked up this modern reprint of The Art of Dialing by William Laybourne, first published in 1669. It was a really fun read, and it has some charming details like the symbols he used in its constructions to mark the equator, or as he would have said, the equinoctial, the Tropic of Capricorn, and the Tropic of Cancer. Nice. The whole book is an amazing mixture of astronomical theory, instrument design, and practical geometry. At the very end of the book, it goes on to give the same constructions done in algebraic terms, using trig functions more as we would recognize them. When showing how to create a basic horizontal dial, Leiborn drafts the hour lines in a very different way than what we saw before. He sets up a projection of the Earth itself. 
It starts with a side view of the Earth, with the poles at the top and bottom, and the equator being the horizontal diameter. Then the target latitude is marked off, not from the equator, but from your nearest pole. To do this he uses chords, which is a trig function largely forgotten today, though it used to be a lot more popular. Ptolemy wrote the entire Almagest using nothing but chords, and that defined Western astronomy for the next 1500 years. They're the straight line distance between two ends of an arc for any given angle. Think of a bowstring or cord being stretched from A to B. Leiborn gives directions for creating a full scale of chords from 0 to 90 degrees. With this made, it is easy to convert between angles and the corresponding chord length for a circle of that radius. So if we want to mark an angle on a circle of the same size, instead of using a protractor as before, we set our compass using the scale. This is then marked on the circle. There we go, 47 degrees, give or take. Now we can make the mark for our latitude angle. Remember that this is actually the co-latitude, as it is being measured from the pole, not the equator. Next, a line is drawn from point E to our new mark. Where this line crosses the meridian shows the position of the pole if the sphere of the Earth was rotated towards us by the target latitude. That's cool, but how does this construction actually work? It took some puzzling out, but what is being done makes more sense to my mind if we rephrase it using trig functions. We know this angle is the value of the latitude, so this angle is the co-latitude, that is, 90 degrees minus the latitude. With that we get expressions for x and y using sine and cosine. Using those, the tangent of the angle at E equals x over 1 plus y. That expands to the sine of the co-latitude over 1 plus the cosine of the co-latitude, which is the same thing as tangent of co-latitude over 2. Because the tangent of E is p over 1, we now have an expression for the length of p. But why did Leiborn do this? It took some more digging through a book of map projections, but then I remembered my trig identities. The tangent of the co-latitude over 2 is the same as the cotangent of the latitude over 2. And that just happens to be the textbook definition of a stereographic projection. This projection was known at least as far back as Ptolemy's time in this geometric form. Using the same technique, Leiborn also rotates the equator, and that is then used to project the hour lines into their elliptical forms. Quite a lovely little construction, and much more compact than the form shown above. Later in the book, Leiborn describes an instrument he designed to make this whole process easier. He calls it the horological trigon, or trigonal instrument. It is basically a physical trig table with scales for tangents, sines, and chords. It also has the scale of hours, which is really a second tangent scale specifically designed for laying out the hour lines. Unfortunately, my facsimile printing did not include a copy of this diagram, nor did any of the other versions I could find online. It appears as if this diagram wasn't even included in later editions, and none of the scanned copies are first editions. The only evidence for it online I could find at all was it included in a listing for an original edition up for sale. Obviously, I wasn't going to spend that much. Obviously, I was going to make my own. Something with a name that glorious deserves to be brought back to life. After a couple hours messing around in Inkscape, then finally coming to my senses and writing a quick Python script, it was done. I played around with some paper versions to convince myself it worked, then I decided to do it properly, and the only proper substrate for scientific instruments is brass. This was my first time using the household's new vinyl cutter for making an etching mask, which I was excited to try. I haven't been particularly happy with the quality of my metal etching in the past using laser jet heat transfer methods. Picking out all the little vinyl chads took over two hours, but it looked promising. As normal I etched in ferric chloride for 45 minutes. I tried painting it with the mask in place to save time later, then cleaned up the edges on the mill. The paint didn't quite get down into all the crevices, but the etching results are good enough that I don't care. I've never been able to get lines so consistent or fine before. I'm going to get some dial wax and silvering powder to finish this off properly, assuming such things are being shipped during lockdown. In any case, it was definitely good enough to try it out. Using it is a lot easier than making it. After establishing the 12 o'clock and 6 o'clock lines, the trigon is used to mark the tangent of 45 degrees on the 12 o'clock line, and the sine of the target latitude on both sides of the 6 o'clock line. These points are connected and those lines are bisected by the 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock lines. 
Then the scale of hours is laid down so that its tick marks for 6, 9, and 12 o'clock are simultaneously touching their respective hour lines. The scale gives the points for the missing 7, 8, 10, and 11 o'clock hours, and the same is done for the other side. This is really doing the exact same thing we saw in the first construction, except instead of all the intermediary steps to generate the sine of L and then the tangent of T times the sine of L, the trigon is used as a lookup table to make it all faster and much more compact. Making something like a horological trigon might seem a bit complicated, but we have vector drawing programs and laser printers and calculators. If you were a 17th century instrument maker who didn't even have reliable trig tables, you can see how this might have been a good investment. So there it is, your whirlwind tour of sundials and pre-modern calculating techniques. Let me know if you'd like to see more of this kind of thing in the future. I've enjoyed putting it together as a change of pace, if nothing else. And stay safe, everyone.